Hello, everyone. That was really that was really powerful. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you for that. So we're going to be looking at Matthew 25 today. But before we go into 25, we're going to look a little bit at 23 to get some context. Because I, I very much believe that context matters. Um, context actually is almost everything. So in Matthew 25, we have a scene where Jesus is basically standing across the street from the temple and looking down at the temple from the Mount of Olives. And, but in 23, he's in the temple. And in 23, this is actually the scene in another one of the Gospels where he comes in and overturns the temple, and overturns the, the money changers. And it's in that time that he kind of goes at it with the scribes and the Pharisees and, um, and the Sadducees. And in the middle of going at it, it's actually the same time, actually, with the tax collectors that we talked about earlier. Um, in 23, 25, he says, he just, he just kind of is like, whoa. <laughs> okay, woe, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. Now let me tell you, I just don't want to be a Pharisee on this day, okay? I don't want to be a Pharisee on that day. First clean the inside of the cup, so that the outside also may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and of all kinds of filth. Okay, can, do you get the picture? Jesus is a little bit pissed, okay? And I'm sorry if I just pissed you off, but whatever, okay? So he's a, little mad, he's a little angry, he's a little mad. And he's not just mad, he's, he's actually cussing these people out. He literally, he is literally cursing the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, which are the teachers. They are the spiritual leaders of the time. Which are on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And then, and then my favorite, you drop down a little bit and he says, You snakes! <laughs> you brood of vipers! How can you escape being sentenced to hell? Okay, so again, I would not want to be a Pharisee on this day. And he brought hell into it. Really? Like, we don't really talk a whole lot about hell. But only a couple of chapters later, in chapter 25, he whips hell back out again. So there's some rep repetition going on here. And there's relationship between these two things that happen. Because really what he's done is he's gone out from this. He has this interaction. And then he basically takes his disciples. He goes, come on, guys, and women, who are not actually listed in the text because it's a patriarchal text. Hello, somebody. Hello. Um, right? But, and he says, come on with me across the street. So they go across the street, they go up the mountain, and you know, now they're looking. And I'm sure if you've been there, you, can, you know that you literally, like, the, the, the temple looks like it's, like, right there. You can reach out and touch it from the Mount of Olives. And that's when he launches into this piece that we, many of us have learned it, you know, with felt boards in, in Sunday school, you know, um, in, 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 in school, in, in uh, church when we were little. But he launches into this whole big piece about, about heaven and hell, about what it's going to take to get there. It's not about how to be good and how to be bad. Let's just get that clear. It's not about how to be good and how to be bad. It's about something else entirely. In verse 31, Jesus says to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Okay. 
So let's just break this down. I love word study. I mean, I'm a word study kind of person. Um, so I was studying this the very first time um, in a bookstore. And I, you know, you get kind of inspired when you get in a bookstore. You think, oh, I have to understand everything, right? So, so I thought, well, what does that word nations really mean? Does it actually mean nations? Or does it mean something else? And I'm not sure what it was that, cre- that piqued my curiosity. But one of the things about my hermeneutic is that I truly do believe that the text itself will raise questions for us. That it's those questions we have to pay attention to if we want to go dig deeper and get into the meat of the text. So this question rose, raised up for me. Part of it also is that in my human rights background, I understand that nation states the way that we have them today are a modern construct. You know, they, they literally did not have them back in the time of, of the writing of the, of, of the Bible. So it turns out that this word actually means people groups, ethnic groups, right? So, so it, it would read something like all the people groups or ethnic groups will be gathered before the, the son of man. And he will separate people one from another. Now I thought to myself, is this people as in he will separate individuals or is, is this people as in he will separate the ethnic groups? Because if you go back to that direct, you know, the, the first uh, uh, identified noun, this pronoun is identified by that first identified noun, which is the people groups. So it turns out that that word people in the actual Greek is the word them. It's not people, it's them. So in translation, they kind of translated it people, but it actually is the word them. And them goes back to that, that first clarified noun, which is the people group. So it would read something like all the people groups or ethnic groups will be gathered before the Son of Man, and he will separate the people groups one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, we get one of two pictures here. We either get a picture of the Son of Man separating out, you know, the Irish from the English, (laughs) um, from the Australians, from the U.S. people in the U.S. Um, In the U.S., some of the African Americans might go over here and some of the, the Native Americans would go over here. And you get that picture Or you get another picture. The thing that I want to say here is that if we're honest with ourselves, at this point in the text, we don't know the answer. It's not clear yet. So let's keep going. And I'm hoping, I think, that we get more of a picture the further we go into the text. And it continues and it says, And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So this, this, this really kind of brought to mind for me the image um, that we get in Micah 4, 1 through 5, where you have all the nations streaming to the highest mountain, and they're all asking God, who, of course, lives on the highest mountain, about to arbitrate between strong nations for them. It's that king that now is saying, come. That king is saying, come. And that word come is not just, yo, come here, because like I said, everybody's from Philly. Um, it's, it's not. It's actually come closer. It's an invitation to intimacy. You that are blessed by my father. That word blessing, it's not just, I bless you, right? It is actually speaking well of. To bless means to speak well of. And like to curse is actually to speak ill of, to bless and to curse. So here, the king, the king of the kingdom of God, the king who all the nations, the people groups will stream to, asking for arbitration between them, that king will call those on his right and say, come. Come closer. I want intimate relationship with you. I get, I get the picture of the king, my daddy, inviting me up onto my daddy's lap. You know, inviting me up just to be closer. 
And then it says for. And the word for is critical because this is what we call a logical connector. These, the four connects two parts of logic. That's what logical connectors do. One logical connector is and, right? So blank and blank means basically the blank plus blank. Blank but blank basically means this happened, but the opposite is true. The opposite happened, but, but this was the result, right? Well, four is because. So that logic means whatever happened before happened because of this. You following? All right. So what's, what's the four? Four, so you're invited closer into intimate relationship with the king. Four, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a, a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Now, again, I just got really crazy on word study in this, and I'm glad I did, because I found out a lot of stuff. I mean, I looked at that word hungry, and I thought, well, what does that word really mean? You know, normally you're kind of just satisfied with hungry, but actually that word means famished. It's not like I missed a meal. It's, it's like I, I haven't eaten in a long time and I don't know where my next meal is coming from. Famished. Think bloated bellies. Think flies in the eyes. Famine. Famished. Thirsty. Thirsty means thirsty, so there you go. Stranger. The stranger is literally, I mean, it means sojourner through your borders. It means, it means immigrant. I was an immigrant and you welcomed me. And when you go back to Leviticus 25 and you go back to different Levitical laws, it actually commands the Hebrew people to treat the immigrant the same as they would treat the citizen. So it's interesting that Jesus brings this in here. I was naked and you gave me clothing. This word naked, the word naked, um, I don't know, I don't know if you guys have this here. I know in America, we have a couple of places where like nudity is kind of a thing, right? So you got your nude beaches, um, you have in Times Square, there's a guy called Naked Man who comes out every once in a while and will like strum his guitar <laughs> completely naked. Um, on Berkeley campus, there's another naked man guy who gets into arguments completely naked. It's hilarious. But that's not this. <laughs> this is not by choice. The word naked here literally means stripped. Think, think about that. Stripped. One who is stripped of all they have. Everything. Exposed. Vulnerable. And sick. That word sick. The word sick actually doesn't just mean... <laughs> I have a cold. It means diseased. Diseased. And in prison. The word prison means prison, so there you go. But the majority, and not the majority, but a good number of prisoners who were in prison at this time would likely have been political prisoners as much as they were criminals. They would have been zealots who were trying to overturn the empire. They would have been people who were seen as a threat to the establishment, any one of the establishments, as much as they might have been someone who stole a loaf of bread. I was in prison and you visited me. So then it says where I, it has this verse that actually has, it's the place where it turns. I believe that you find that you unlock the meaning of this text with this next verse. It says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you, a stranger, and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? So stop for a second. Pause on the word righteous. 
I would like for you to go into your twos, and I'd like for you to talk between you for two minutes, one minute each. And I'd like for you to, to talk about when you hear the word righteous, what do you think? Go. Two minutes each. Go. And begin to wrap up. Okay, great. Let's come back together. So what did you say? So if you're thinking righteous, what, are, what comes to mind when you think righteous? Anybody? Just call it out. Correct. Correct. Oh, that's interesting. That's good. Thank you. Anybody else? Thinks they're correct. Thinks they're correct. Okay. I like that. That's even better. Look at that. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? When you think righteous, what do you think? Right standing. Right standing. Anybody else? Tries to be good. Others? Any others? Maybe one or two more? Preachy. Wait, say it again. Preachy. Preachy. <laughs> yes. One more. There's one more. Anybody? Holy. holy. Oh, that's so good. I'm glad somebody said that. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thinks they're holy. Okay, that's right. That's right. Thank you. So, okay, guys. This is what's so deep about this. So when I did my little word study on this, what I found was that this word righteous actually can only be translated one way. I know I hear a lot of times it can be translated either holy or just. But actually, this, is, this word can only be translated as just. The just ones. And if you split the hair, the word is actually ones of equitable action and character. Get that. Ones of equitable action and character. So write that down in your notes on your phone. <laughs> now let's just talk about equity. Because here's the thing. You cannot talk about equity without talking about the systems and structures and policies that govern common life. You just can't. You can't talk about equity without talking about systems because by the very nature of what equity means it actually it demands that you look at the way things work so how would you define equity I actually asked a group of um, of national faith leaders this these are heads of denominations I have to say actually I didn't ask this they were asking it and I was in the room because it was an ecumenical gathering and they just nobody really had an answer for what is equity how is it different from equality because it's different they're two different things so I got up and I stood up and I shared with them what I usually share in this talk and I shared okay Maybe this will work. When you think of equality, think that I have two buckets, one bucket in each hand. And in one bucket, you have 1,000 gold coins. In another bucket, you have 1,000 copper coins. Do I have an equal number of coins in each bucket? Yes, right. Do I have an equitable distribution of resources between each bucket? No, that is the difference between equality and equity. Another way to look at it this is this way. Okay, anybody here like football or soccer? I don't know what you guys call it here. All over the world it's called something different. What do you guys call it here? Soccer. Okay, cool. I relate. Some of you are like football, okay. <laughs> She's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Okay, so I was, in, I was in Croatia once and I made the mistake of saying soccer. They were like, football, football. It's like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> football, football. So I saw this incredible football match. Um, I don't even know how long ago. I think it was like towards the end of the 1990s. It was that, I don't, I don't, y'all, it's too long of a game for me. I can't deal. I'm sorry. I need more action in my games. And so, but this one was incredible because like, I think it was Germany against some other team. I don't remember exactly <laughs> some other team. I, I really don't remember Germany. Oh, maybe against Argentina or something where they won it in overtime and penalty kicks. It was incredible. Right now, so now I want you to imagine that like we're watching the World Cup, right? And all the countries come in and, and, and there's this one country that no matter when they play, part of the rules of the game is that whenever they play at the World Cup, 
they have to play on a slanted playing field. Literally, the field is always slanted for them at 45, no, sorry, let's make it 90 degree angle. A 90 degree angle. And there, the part of the rules of the game, part of the structure of the game is that it's tilted and they always have to play going uphill. Let me ask you, I know this does not exist, but it's, it's hypothetical, right? Would this team ever win the World Cup? Right, okay, y'all are being honest. I love that, thank you. So what if they would not win the World Cup? I want you to go back to your twos or your tables, and I want you to figure out a way to level that playing field. Go. How are you going to do it? What are the different ways that you can, as one of the just ones, as one of the ones of equitable action and character, create equity between these, these teams? Go. You get, you get three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. Okay, I'm hearing people coming back, so we're going to come back a little bit early. That was good, you guys. That was fast. Okay, so let's, let's hear from you. What, did you. what did you come up with? What are some ways for us to create equity in this soccer, in this soccer match? Anybody? Say it again. Yes. Right, right. That's one way, right? You can actually turn and make it so that the rules say that everybody is playing on a tilt, right? That's pretty good. I like that. How about anybody else? One of the teams, which team? Okay. <laughs> so they get 10 points to begin with. Okay, so they get 10 points to begin with. Now that's a change of the rules, right? So that's pretty cool. Okay, anybody else? Here? Say it again. <laughs> Pump helium into the ball so that the ball is a lot easier to get uphill. That's it. And that's changing a structure. That's a, that's a structural change. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so that they're like, they're walking on heels, but it actually doesn't feel like it. They're walking level. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Right, so that's also a structural change. That's changing the structure of their equipment. That's cool, okay. Anybody else? Ch well, you already spoke, right? Did you already speak? Okay. <laughs> you, I'm sure you do, I'm sure. Let's go right behind you. There was somebody in the white shirt. I mean, actually, level the field, right? But how are you going to do it? How would you level the field? Uh -huh. uh, oh, okay. So you could actually just do that, right? Right. Okay. So then you're going to actually add dirt. You're going to add dirt to raise the field up so that it's level. That's right. Okay. That's great. Okay. Anybody else? So that's changing structure. Okay. Good. Anybody else? So yeah, so that, now that's changing rules, right? So that instead of having the rules be so that that one team has to always play up, uphill, you could have it so that both teams have to change sides, like, you know, at the different quarters, or each team, every team has to play uphill at some point. I don't know, you know what I mean. Half, half, sorry, half. You get what I'm saying, right? Okay, anybody else? Any other thoughts? There's a lot of great thoughts here. You guys haven't, you haven't said one that I heard in Croatia that I thought was hilarious. Okay, keep going. Oh, okay, I've never heard that one. That's good. So she said blindfold the team that's playing downhill. That would give them a good disadvantage. That's really good. That's good. Another one that I heard that I thought was really funny was just, you know, put a back, put jetpacks on the one, you know, on the team that has to go uphill. They'll always get it, you know, whatever. So we'll see. So, so but you get the point, right? There are ways. There are ways to create equity. But if you're going to do it, it's not enough just for you to, to, you know, have pity on this one team one time. You have to change the structure or the rules. You hear me? You've got to change the structure or the rules or both. Okay?
So now let's think about this in terms of inequity in our society. Let's go a little bit, you know, go a little closer to home. Um, in America, one way to think of this is in America, we have, um, we, we do this thing called the wealth gap. We actually, we actually measure the gap between different people groups in America. And the clearest gap that is always studied like every few years, actually somebody's doing a study on this, is the gap between the middle class within people of European descent, white folk, and people of African descent, African Americans. So everybody in this study is middle class because you're looking at the median. And they ask the question of what's the median net wealth within the African American and the white folk, right? So median net wealth is basically all your assets minus your debt, right? It's what you can liquidate, you know, on a dime if you really need something, right? So what do you think was the median net wealth of your middle class white American? Like what would you say would be their median net wealth in US, USD, US dollars? Give a sense of that. Say it again, 100,000, 100,000. Anybody want to go higher or lower, higher or lower? 50,000, higher or lower, higher or lower? Higher or lower than 50,000? Higher than 50,000, where are you going to, give me something. 34, that's lower. <laughs> 30, okay, so 34,000, all right, y'all, it's 116,000. Median, we're talking about the middle, 116,000 is your median wealth for, for, for white folk in America, right? People who are deemed white by the state who are European descent. Now, what is the median net worth, net wealth, for people of African descent in America? What do you think? Median, remember, this is all middle class, median net wealth for African Americans in America. Anybody? 80, so anybody want to go higher or lower? Higher or lower, 80,000. 80, lower, 60,000 I heard. Anybody want to go higher or lower than 60,000? 113,000? 130,000, so more, more than the white folk. Okay, so 130. Okay, just for the sake of time, it's 6,000. Yes. And that explains my life, you people. Yes. Six. Yes. So think about that. There's reasons for this. It's because the structures and the systems have been created in ways for 400 years to advantage white people inequitably. You getting it? You get it? You get it? You start to get it. Now, let's, let's talk about Ireland. Can we talk about Ireland for a minute? <laughs> we went a little bit deeper, right? So in Ireland, I was just, you know, literally, I'm no expert. In fact, I got James to help me with this today. He sent a couple of, um, a couple of links. And thank you, Katie, for, for correlating them for me. A few of them. Katie, by the way, is my executive assistant. Wave. Hi, Katie. Woo, she's awesome. She makes everything happen. Um, so one thing that, that, that I saw that you've probably seen and, and um, James shared is the top 10% of Ireland's population receives 25% of the nation's wealth, the nation's income, not wealth, but income, according to a report um, published recently. And then the bottom 40% only receive 22%. So think about that inequity. So you have the top 10% living on a quarter of the resources. And then, and let me tell you, if you're in America, it's much, much worse. So we have what they call laissez-faire free market capitalism, which is like capitalism on steroids. So we look at you guys and we go, wow, that's the promised land. But actually it's not because what's happened here and what you can see in the inequity in your system is that there are those who just can't have enough resources because the resources are being hoarded. You see what I'm saying? They're being hoarded by a few, just 10% owns a quarter of the income. 
Another, um, another stat that I thought that was really interesting was that when you look at the top and bottom five unemployment rates here in, in Ireland, um, what you find is that the, the top five, in other words, the, the top five that, that are not struggling with unemployment are number one, what do you think is number one? And this is also among non Irish nationals, right? So, um, so non Irish people. French is number one. They're actually doing the best of everybody. But not far behind is Swedish, Germans, Italians, and Belgians. Do you notice anything about all of them? What do you notice about them? They're white people. I mean, as we would say on, online, it's not white people, it's white people, right? It's white people, right? So they're white. And so look at that. The un they are the ones getting employed the most. Now, what's the bottom? What do you think is the bottom? The bottom five. Say it again. Travelers. <laughs> you know what? They don't even have travelers on this list. And I don't, it's probably because, it might be because this came earlier before the travelers is like, they're never, you're not even recognized. Okay, so, and actually, I think this was one that, was, that came out in 2016 before travelers were recognized as an actual ethnic group. Wow, come on now. Okay, she's like, we've been here since the 11th century. Come on, people. All right, so, but what do you think of the, the bottom five? The bottom five are Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Nigerian, Saudi Arabian, and Congolese. What do you notice about them? They are people of color. And so is it possible for you to have equitable society if people are not being hired? And when you see the pattern, when you, and there, you must look for patterns because equity has everything to do with patterns. It has to do with, with rates and patterns. When you see the pattern that the top five are people of European descent, white European, and the bottom five are people who are not, and most likely people of color, then you know that there's something racialized that's going on. There's a racialized uh, system of hiring that is happening that keeps people down. So now, what I want you to do, I mean, I want to just, first of all, just think about, I want to think about I want to, well, a couple of things. One is, in my last six minutes, uh, one is this text actually raises the question of heaven and hell in a way that is uncomfortable for us. We barely know what to do with it, especially us Protestants. Don't know what to do with this because it raises the question of works righteousness and all that stuff. You've, I'm, sure you've, I'm sure you've been thinking that probably at some point. Like, is this, does this mean that we have, to, we have to do this stuff in order to get into heaven? All I'm saying is that if you actually say you believe the text, then you have to believe the text. You cannot say you believe the text and not believe the text. And you cannot twist this text to mean something it's not saying. I don't think that it's talking about works righteousness. I think it's actually much more akin to something that, that Mother Teresa once said. She talked about the fact that it is the Holy Spirit that works through our hands and our feet. The Holy Spirit does the work of the Spirit through us. I think that it's saying that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, then you will do these things. And in fact, we know what the Holy Spirit does because the word tells us what the Holy Spirit does. The word tells us that, in fact, there's a, there's a verse in the Old Testament that says the Spirit, this is what the Spirit of the Lord does. It protects the widow and the immigrant and the orphan and the poor. That is what the Holy Spirit does. And so if we cannot say that we are of, we are following Jesus, we cannot say definitively that we have the Holy Spirit in us if we do not get up off, off the couch and do what we can to make the systems and structures bless all rather than blessing a few at the expense of the many. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
that it is a mark, one of the marks, one of the ways that the Father will know, the Son of Man will know that you are a sheep or a goat, is are these things present in you? The last thing is, it actually does say, it keeps going, then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are cursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then of course, what are they going to say? They're like, whoa, when did we not do that? Why do you, I don't remember seeing you and... You know, and then what's he going to say? Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, one of the least deserving prisoners, one of the people who have the least amount, who has been stripped the most, one of the ones who have the least clean water, one of the ones who have the least food, good food to eat, one of the ones who are the least welcome. When you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And what's so amazing is that Jesus was literally all of these things in the course of his life. He was an immigrant. He was thirsty. If you call being hung on a cross sick, there you go. He was imprisoned. He was stripped. He was all of these things. And he was hangry. Not hungry. He was hangry when he was in the desert and he was fasting. You can't say that you love Jesus and you don't love actively in every sphere of life, with your hands and feet and your votes. The least of these. Now we're going to come back to that image of him standing on the other side and looking at the temple. And the thing that really occurred to me was that as they, the disciples, are standing there looking at the temple, they're looking at the seat of power. They're looking at the people, the very people, who actually said, we are the chosen ones, right? The ones, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, particularly the Pharisees, who said, because we are Jewish, because we are Hebrew people, we are the chosen ones. They did actually think that their salvation was in their ethnic group. But you know what Jesus, I think he's done here? I think Jesus has flipped the script. I think that what Jesus has done is Jesus has created a new ethnic group. It's called the just ones. I think that the picture is actually one where you have the nations, the ethnic groups standing before you and the ones that go to the right are the ones sifted from all the groups. They become a new ethnic group and they call the just ones. The just ones. So the question of this text is are you one of the just ones? Will you be one of the just ones? Will you not stand for the oppression of those poor soccer players? Will you not stand for the oppression of brown workers in your nation? Will you not stand for the inequitable distribution of resources and wealth in your nation? Are you the just ones? That is the question. Because the Holy Spirit is just. Amen.